Welcome to the World Healing Tour podcast, where our mission is to help you heal yourself so you can heal the world. Hi, my name is Noah Crane. Each week, we will bring you tips and tools to inspire you to live a more empowered and joyful life. I'm also the founder of the 3G Effect Mindset, a daily practice to keep you heart-centered in everything you do by taking three important actions. Number one, every day having a grateful heart and connecting to your gratitude. Number two, every day remember to ground in love and compassion. First, love and compassion for yourself and then also learning to share that love and compassion with others. Because whatever you want, whatever you put out into the world energetically, I promise you will come back to you. And number three, know that you're not alone on this journey. You are always being guided by God. God is beside you, inside you, and all around you. Feel God's presence. Listen to the messengers that he sends your way and how he guides you daily on your journey. By practicing that 3G effect mindset, you will truly start seeing how your life starts transforming and you start attracting more positive things that you want into your life. I wanna share an amazing miracle with you. I was on the phone with my mom just now. My mom is 84 years old. She's very active. She walks every day, she goes to the health club, she loves to take care of herself. Well, I just found out that my mom fell four days ago and she didn't even tell us because she didn't wanna worry me and my brother and sister. But um, she has a cast on her arm, but she's okay, thank God. And um, she is just you know, grateful that she fell and she's okay, she's able to do everything. And she just told me this on the way here to the studio. So I'm just so grateful for God for always watching over my mom, over my family, and uh, so present to the miracle of being healthy and well. Today, we're gonna be speaking about an amazing topic that is so important uh, for our well being. Is health truly wealth? Why is it so important to take care of our body so that our body can take care of us. My guest today, Dr. Emi, is a medical doctor for over 20 years, who is board certified in internal medicine with specialized training in holistic and functional medicine. She specializes in helping her patients effortlessly lose fat while they become more youthful, vibrant, and toned. She does this by doing comprehensive testing, including detailed genetic, hormonal balance, cardiometabolic, vitamin level, adrenal, and microbiome testing. She believes test, don't guess, to get to the bottom of every person's health issue and address their specific thing that's going on with them. Dr. Amy, welcome to the World Healing Tour podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here, Noah. I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much. And I, you know, I follow you on Instagram. You are just amazing. You're a wealth of information. I'm actually telling my friends now, follow Dr. Amy, follow Dr. Amy, because I learned so much just from watching your videos. Like you share so much information with us and it really is a gift. Um, can you tell me why you are so passionate about what you do? Absolutely. Well, you know, like most things, uh, I think a lot of us come to where we are through our personal journey. So I had two really huge personal journeys and then probably a third that got me into genetics, but the two that got me into holistic health were my own. I was once 100 pounds overweight. I was going from doctor to doctor seeking help. I myself was an internal medicine doctor, really did not get help. And so I had to kind of go back to the drawing board and figure out what are the reasons that I'm not able to lose weight? Because I'm eating a 1200 calorie vegan diet. I'm exercising every day. And yet I'm a hundred pounds overweight. People looking at me think I'm a couch potato who sits around eating all day. So <clears throat> because of that, I have a lot of compassion for people who struggle like I do, who try everything, but nothing works for. Because for me, it turned out that there were so many things wrong. I had a hard to diagnose autoimmune thyroid disease. I had issues with my gut health that were lifelong. I had had lots of antibiotics as a kid. Nobody had ever looked at the fact that my gut health was off and was causing so many different issues for me, including pain and fatigue. 
I had uh, an issue with my genetics where I wasn't processing B vitamins properly. Um, so, and I had insulin resistance. I had insulin resistant PCOS in fact, which is what a lot of women face. And so, you know, nobody really had the expertise to say, you know, this is what you have and this is how you should modify your lifestyle for you uh, to really be successful. And one of the genetics that I found out that I had was a gene called FTO, the familial obesity gene. And people with this gene do very well if they strength train and if they eat protein, which were two things that I was not really doing. And so knowing the specifics about me made me successful. And I see so many people struggle because they're put into a weight loss plan that really isn't suited for their genetics, for their hormones and all of that. So I wanted to bring this kind of good news, this gospel of personal medicine to people and let them know that, you know, they are really the key to their own health and testing can get you the answers that you want there. Mm -hmm. And I also had a journey with my son who was on the autism spectrum. And this was kind of before my own journey. I was kind of neglecting my own journey because of this. But he was on the autism spectrum and we had taken him from physician to physician, you know, trying to get help. And at one point I was told, uh, you know, he was, he was five and a half. He was rolling on the floor screaming. And I asked a developmental pediatrician, you know, is this what I can expect for him for the rest of his life? And they said, yeah, we can give you something to calm him down maybe. But, you know, neurologically, he's never going to be different. Well, I was very lucky in that I was looking and looking and I happened to be this was the internet wasn't where it is now. This was about 2003. Um, I happened to get invited to a dinner for the Dan Doctors of Autism. And these physicians were actually treating autism through a dietary approach. Mm. And I'm not saying it's gonna work for everyone, but what they were doing is they were taking kids off gluten, dairy, artificial color, artificial flavor, and sugar, refined sugar. And so I did this for my son just because I was desperate. I was like, well, I have no, nothing to lose as long as it's not harmful, I'm doing it. Um, and they also would put kids on fish oil. And when I did that, my son totally calmed down. All of his very strange behaviors went away. And then a little while later, um, you know, he had horrible allergies. And a lot of people on the autistic spectrum, the medicines that they get, the additives and the medicines affect them more than the medications can sometimes have. That was what was happening with my son with his allergies. But allergy medicine actually made his tonsils so huge. They wrapped around, uh, you know, his, his trachea and they had to be taken out. And, um, you know, it just was not helping his allergies any. So I had a friend that said, well, you know, why don't you try this antioxidant mix for him? I did. And actually, he went from not recognizing letters to reading in three months so that he could read recipes. And to this day, he's an amazing chef. And so it really taught me a lot about fundamentals about looking at what's wrong. Once I learned a little bit more about what goes on with kids on the autistic spectrum, a lot of them have the same B vitamin issue that I did. A lot of them uh, have issues with antioxidants. They're, they don't have antioxidants in their cells enough. And so their lipids, their, uh, the lining of their cells actually gets oxidized and damaged. Um, and so that's why the fish oil was really important. That's why this antioxidant was really important. And so this was looking at him at a very fundamental level, at the level of his cells, at the level of his genetics. And it was knowledge that I happened upon, but then I thought, you know, there has to be the same sort of thing going on in other illnesses and other issues that people are facing. And so what I had learned with my son, I sort of started to apply to everything, kind of getting to the nitty gritty and the bottom of it. And then I got some training in functional medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, and, and um, kind of improve my armamentarium of how I could look at and help patients. Um, so that's where it started. And then I sort of had another little family health crisis that kind of made me really want to get into genetics. That's, that is absolutely amazing. It's how we go through the dark things that we learn from, through our experience and we learn to help others through those dark periods. So how is your son doing today? He's great. He graduated college with a degree in fishery science, and he is looking for work right now. <laughs> so, yeah, he's an amazing kid. I mean, he's, uh, you know, an able chef, somebody that can live independently, actually a very, very organized person. Um, so, yeah, so he's somebody that, you know, is very vastly different than the prognosis I was given when he was a kid. That's amazing. So you're able to heal your son holistically. 
how important is, that, is it for us not to put a Band-Aid on our health? I feel like so many people put a Band-Aid on health. You know, we try to find like an easy solution. Uh, we don't really know what's going on. We Google things. Um, what, what do you say about that? Yeah, I mean, it's so important to look at things at a very fundamental level, because for instance, if I had given my son medications to calm him down, I'm firmly convinced that maybe he would have been calm, but he would not have been neurologically different at all. I don't think he would have ever graduated college. Um, and same with my own health. You know, maybe I would have lost a few pounds, but I'm sure if I had not solved a fundamental issue, they would have all come roaring back. And that's what a lot of people face. You know, a lot of these things that we call diseases have fundamental issues that are underneath them, like insulin resistance that leads to diabetes. There could be infection. There could be inflammation. There could be genetic issues, mm -hmm. which you treat differently depending on what the genetics are for that person. So it's really important if you're facing a health issue to try to find somebody who's not going to just gloss it over, not going to just, you know, talk to you for five minutes and hand you a prescription and send you out the door, but really look for why am I here and what can I do differently in my life so that I can be healthy. Makes a lot of sense. What I found also that a lot of times you do get misdiagnosed. Like I've went to people that have tested me and then I feel like they're not really hitting the issue and, and things don't get better. What do you tell people that have tried going to different physicians and different path, but they just haven't found the right path yet? Keep researching and advocate for yourself. <laughs> That's really my, my biggest, you know, my biggest mm -hmm. advice to people because um, and don't take, you know, oh, it's just this for an answer when, you know, there could be things that could be done for you uh, because you are your own best health advocate. So it's really important that you, uh, you know, continue to push for yourself and keep looking until you find the person that can actually help you. So basically never give up. <laughs> <laughs> So as we age, so many things change. So many things change in our body and in our life. How do we cope with the changes? And how do we keep ourselves? What are some things to look for as we age to help us stay more young and more youthful? Well, I would say, you know, what you were talking about, Noah, at the very beginning is A number one. I think it's actually more important than food, more important than exercise, mindset, mm -hmm. you know. Think of yourself as this healthy, grateful person that has a lot going for them in life. Love yourself. You know, don't be an overcritical uh, person to yourself. Um, I think, you know, and then, you know, learn to rely on the divine and, and tap into that power. Because if you don't, you're missing a big part of your healing. Um, I actually had an experience in college where I had this just crisis where, um, you know, I was put in this dorm where I was doing research and my whole life, I had always eaten healthy food. I even lived with my grandma in college. She made me like homemade Persian food every day. Mm. Um, and then I was put in this dorm and the food was like all this processed food. It had all this cornstarch. And I remember just feeling so depressed and I was um, applying for medical school and I just could not like get the uh, motivation to even fill out my applications. And here I was, I was like a Howard Hughes research scholar put in this dorm because I had done so much you know, great undergraduate research. And it just, you know, first of all, again, brought to me the power of, you know, what, what you put in your mouth. But also at that time, like there were no nature paths or no functional medicine doctors. There was really nobody to help me. Um, and I just remember in my dorm room, just sitting there and going like, what is going on? And I tapped into the divine. That's actually what came down to me and was like, snap out of this. You can do this. And, um, you know, it was, it was just spiritual healing that occurred. And it's something that I really believe in tapping into as part of our healing journey. I, I'm not saying to, you know, uh, basically ignore material things. I'm an internal medicine doctor. I'm trained on the hard facts. But I think it's really important to tap into that spiritual side of things. And, you know, gratitude has actually been proven to help people improve their health. Um, you know, self-love is proven to help people improve their health. Um, tapping into a higher power is something that's been proven over and over again to help people with all kinds of things, including addictions. Um, and so for me, it was really something that helped me with my mental health. And so I really super believe in what you were talking about in the beginning. I think that's one of the most important things you can do. Of course, nutrition is important. Of course, exercise is important. But mindset is a number one because you can't really do any of the other two if your mindset isn't one that honors you, that tells you to put your own oxygen mask on first because you love yourself 
so that you can be of service to others. Well, you know, you're speaking my language. <laughs> I love yeah. everything you're saying. So absolutely. So if somebody is yeah. just starting this journey and they want to take better care of themselves and eat better, what are some things you could advise them to stay away from? What should they not be eating? I know there's so much man-made food out there and there's toxins yeah. in the waters and all kinds of things. Can we talk a little bit about that? I would love to hear what yeah, you're Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> there's a lot of what we call xenoestrogens in our environment. So they're like these chemicals that act like hormones in our bodies. You know, see young boys that have what are called like moves where their, you know, chest is actually like uh, growing breasts. You see women that have more belly fat, more issues with their breasts and all that. So the water supply is not good. And I really uh, basically advise people to get a good reverse osmosis filter. Make sure you're taking good minerals with that though, because that will unfortunately leach minerals out of the water or find a good you know, source for water that's uncontaminated. Um, another great reference that's for everybody is stay away from bad oil. So oils like cottonseed oil, canola oil, corn oil, um, you know, all of these seed oils comes from things that don't really have oil. They're sort of chemically processed to take the little bit of oil that's in them out. And in that process, there's many, many chemicals put in there. There's a lot of alterations of a fat. And altered fat is one of the very worst things when it comes to like cancer, when it comes to damaging your arteries. So staying away from those bad omega-6 fats. If you're going to use fats, use things like olive oil, like, um, you know, um, avocado oil, like, um, Coconut oil, so oils that are not refined or messed with are really super important. Um, things that normally have oil, <laughs> you know, think of it as, you know, if it doesn't normally have an oil, uh, don't be using it as oil. <laughs> you know, cottonseed doesn't really have that much oil. So bad oils, I think, are one of the universal things that I can tell everybody. Um, water is one of the most important things and getting adequate water. So unless you have kidney disease or heart, you know, heart failure where your water has to be limited or you have low sodium, you should be getting a half ounce, an ounce of water per kilogram of ideal body, sorry, per pound of ideal body weight. Um, and that's your ideal body weight. So if your ideal body weight is 150 uh, pounds, then it should be, you know, a half ounce, an ounce of water a day, depending on how active you are. If you're more active, you need more water. And that's super important because uh, you know, your whole health actually depends on hydration, not overeating depends on having enough water on board so that you don't recognize, you recognize thirst and hunger as two different things. Uh, along with that, you want to make sure you're getting enough minerals um, and having those levels checked is really important. So I would say that's a universal for everybody. Um, and then, you know, everything else really comes down to individual recommendation. So people ask me like, is the vegetarian diet the best? Or, you know, is um, paleo the best? Or is keto the best? And the answer to all that is it really depends on your genetics. So for those people for whom keto is the absolute best thing, and they're going to do the best because their body uses fat preferentially as a fuel. And there's people for whom keto is a disaster, because they actually cannot process saturated fat, it's going to envelop their um, insulin receptor and make them more insulin resistant. Uh, that's people who have, for instance, the APOE4 gene, which is also associated with Alzheimer's. So we're all so different that I can't give people like super, um, you know, um, specific diet advice, but the main ones I can give them is the ones about water, about minerals, and about making sure that they're staying away from a lot of omega-6 rich foods. And a lot of you know, processed foods like chips and candies and things that you buy, they're going to be full of those omega-6 oils because they're the cheapest. Yeah, great advice. Um, a lot of people want to know, like, how do what's what's a morning ritual that could start? How could you start your day? I read that you like to drink uh, water with lemon in the morning, first thing. You like, yeah, water with lemon to kind of get the digestion going. Uh, I'm not sensitive to nightshades, so I put a little bit of cayenne pepper in it because that's a metabolic booster. But again, that's not advice for everyone. Some people are very sensitive to nightshades and cayenne pepper is going to increase their inflammation. So there's an enzyme called BCHE that we test for genetically. If you have a great one, you do good with nightshades. If you have not so good one, you don't want to do a lot of nightshades because you're going to overwhelm that enzyme and kind of increase your inflammation and, and um, possibly things like spasms. Um, so I put some cayenne in it. Um, one thing that I really believe, again, is one of those rituals that's great for everyone is grounding, which is 
getting up in the morning and putting your feet in the earth, like actual grass, mm -hmm. something that's the actual earth. Uh, and there's so many studies on that with helping with things like sleep disorders, with helping with things like mood disorders, getting that morning light is so important. Getting your feet out in that morning light is so important. Um, so that's one of the rituals that I really think everyone should do is ground. And then have a mind-body wellness technique that kind of puts you in the right mood during the day. If you're a religious person and you like to pray, pray. If you're a mind-body wellness person or a meditation person, take five or 10 minutes to really think about how you want that day to go, to visualize your day going great. <laughs> um, you know, if you woke up late, take 30 seconds to do it. Um, but I really think that that visualization makes a difference. And when I teach people to do mind-body wellness techniques, I always have a visualization part of it because you always want to project yourself to where you want to be. Yeah, and visualization is so powerful, right? And I love what you said about grounding. And you would recommend people take their shoes off, right, when they walk outside? Yep, yeah, yeah. To get go outside, you possibly can. I mean, if you're an urban jungle, it's going to be a little hard, but find a patch of grass. That's unadulterated if you can and put your feet in it. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, so when people um, go outside and, and they ground and they, they do that, how after doing that, let's say, should they do that before they eat or after they eat? Like, what do you recommend? I recommend doing it the very first thing in the morning. So grounding yourself to the earth, getting those you know negative charges kind of take it, taken off the bottom of your feet as you walk. Um, you know, picking up that morning sun, even if it's rainy, you can actually get some rays that will help program you because your body, you know, responds to these diurnal rhythms and the sun actually really helps with setting what happens with melatonin at night and all that. So getting that morning sun is super important. Um, you know, if you live in an area where you can't get morning sun and you have like seasonal affective disorder, you could even consider getting like a full spectrum UV lamp. Don't use it for long, we don't wanna burn you, but use it for a few minutes um, to kind of give yourself those signals going into your eyes that there's light coming. Um, yeah, so I think that's one really important morning ritual, but I think the most important morning ritual like everything else is get your mindset right. I love yeah. that, I love that. Um, I wanted to ask you, as far as um as far as diet goes, like I heard you talk about certain things that you shouldn't eat first thing in the morning. Uh, what mm -hmm. are those? So simple carbs are usually a terrible idea for most people some <laughs> early in the morning, and that's because um, the first thing in the morning, what you want to do is put some protein in your in your stomach, because what the last thing you want to do is spike up your insulin levels first thing in the morning and then make your blood sugar crash, because then all day you're going to be hungry. Uh, and you'll do that if you eat simple carbs with no fiber in the morning. So fiber is really important in the morning. Protein is really important in the morning. A little bit of good fat is really important in the morning for most people. There are people who can tolerate more carbohydrates. So for them, maybe uh, a little bit of toast might be okay. But for most of us, it's really not. There's not that many of us who do great with carbs. Um, you know, whether or not your fat should be saturated or not, or not is a genetic question uh, depends on a few genetic things that we look at. So when I give someone dietary advice, I've actually checked their hormones, check their genetics, check their food sensitivities, check their food allergies, looked at their gut health, and I designed a diet that's really designed to hit all of these points for them so that they are successful. So for instance, they, if they're a person that spikes insulin, I make sure they don't eat things that are, that are going to do that, like simple sugars. But there's people who don't really genetically spike their insulin. They can be less careful. You know, I have a husband that never gains weight. So I've seen that. <laughs> how, how bad is sugar to, for us? It's pretty bad. It's pretty toxic to the liver. So getting over about 15 grams of, uh, you know, simple carbs a day can start to affect the liver. Um, if you get over 75 grams uh, net carbohydrates, you can you can start to really affect your cholesterol. Um, so, you know, we're not really meant to eat um, that many carbs and then be as sedentary as we are. Uh, you know, in the old days, I remember going to a ranch when I was little and the, the lady that owned the ranch, uh, you know, said, if you gain any weight here, you're not working hard enough. So people maybe in those situations would eat more in the old days because they had to expend tons and tons of calories, but people didn't sit around eating pie and cookies and whatnot, and then like having a sedentary job. So, you know, 
our ancestors were hunter gatherers, they were subsistence farmers, they worked hard. And so, um, you know, their intake of carbs was different. That tradition has been passed down to us who sit most of the day. And that's an issue. That's really an issue because we can't really handle uh, that amount of carbohydrate for the activity that most of us do. Makes a lot of sense. So do you think we need to eat less as we get older? Um, in general, yes. I mean, you don't have the same cellular division as you get older, but you can do some things to improve that cellular division, taking things like uh, glutathione, NAD+, resveratrol. Uh, can sometimes help us, um, you know, CoQ10 can help our mitochondria, the little energy packets in the cells, they'll keep us younger and our cell cells uh, more likely to, you know, uh, have the characteristics of younger cells. But in general, yes, we burn a little bit fewer calories as we get older. Um, so it just really depends on your own energy expenditure. You know, if you're running marathons, maybe you don't need to cut back on your calories. But if you're less active, then you do. And that's actually my number one anti-aging advice is keep moving. Uh, every elderly person I've seen who is really healthy, that's really their motto. And they're not people that kill themselves as athletes, interestingly enough. They're just people who are very steady about getting regular, uh, moderate exercise. How much ex exercise should we do per day? You know, it really depends on you and your genetics. Uh, I would say a minimum of six hours a week um, is good for most people. Three hours at the very, very, very least. Um, three hours a week of, you know, a combo of aerobics and weights. Um, how much weight you lift is really genetically determined. You know, if you have an ACE DB genotype, for instance, and you lift really heavy weights, you're going to get bulky. So if you want to get bulky, lift heavy. If you have ACE DB and you want to stay lean, then you lift lighter weights. So a lot of the advice I give people on workouts is also really based on their genetics. If you have the ACE II genotype, that's your long marathon runner kind of person. They have trouble building muscle. They do much better with like distance and aerobics things. Uh, so those people should really lift heavy weights. They have higher, a higher, harder time, uh, you know, building muscle. Um, certain types of exercise have been shown to really help certain genetics. So if you have the FTO gene that I talked about earlier, HIIT training or high intensity interval training has been shown to really help you versus other people. You're much more responsive to exercise versus some other genetics. Um, and so really how much you exercise depends on your genes. If you have the APOE4 gene, which is the one that's linked to early Alzheimer's and genetic Alzheimer's, exercise should really be a religion for you. Six hours a week is a bare, bare, bare minimum for someone who has APOE4. The reason for that is that people who have APOE4 actually tend to do really well in developing world situations. So places where food is scarce and you have to keep moving to get your food, People with, with those genetics, which are so disadvantageous in the West, give you early Alzheimer's and even early heart disease. In those types of situations, where, when you're in a subsistence situation, people, people with APOE4 live longer, have lower infant mortality. And it's thought that because these fats in their blood actually help in that low calorie, high energy expenditure situation, where they actually have something with which to fight things like parasites and things that they're exposed to in the developing world. And so that's the other thing about genetics is it all really depends on your environment. And if you have genetics that are designed for a more developing world environment and you live in the developed world, you really have to take a look at that and think about, gosh, do I really want to eat the lifestyle of everyone else and end up you know, with insulin resistance and a really high risk of Alzheimer's at 70? Or do I want to dial back and live like someone in the developing world who actually does really well with my genetics? Makes a lot of sense. Can we stay yeah. can we stay fit as we get older? Like, can we still keep our same fitness level that we were in our twenties and thirties? Because I find it so much harder to stay fit as I get older. It's more difficult, and it takes more dedication, and it takes more smarts. And I would say it probably for most of us takes some supplementation, uh, but it is doable. Um, you know, it's definitely not unachievable. I mean, I'm in better shape in my 50s than I have ever been. And that's because I prioritize myself. I decided I was going to put my oxygen mask on first and I was going to prioritize my fitness. And so, you know, this morning I had a personal trainer show up at my house at 6 a.m. My workout was already done by seven. 
I'm not going to skimp on my workout. It's going to get done. Come heck or high water. And so, you know, I'm in great shape because I prioritize that. Um, now, if you have low energy, if, if it's hard for you to do, we need to take a look at why that is. Like a lot of people, you know, if they're not processing B vitamins, they're not taking the proper B vitamins, they're low on vitamin D. Uh, you know, they um, have issues with their mitochondria, the little energy packets in their cell are either damaged or genetically not good. They may not have the energy to exercise, but if we can figure out what their problem is and give them the energy, there's no reason why they can't stay in as good a shape. So it takes a little more dedication, a little more smarts, but it's definitely doable. I love that. Never give up. It's doable. So I just I just keep, you know, fighting it through. And I do believe that I have to work harder as, at it the older I get. And I need to do more weight training, too, to keep my muscles strong. I find that a yes. lot. Yeah. Weight training becomes more important as we get older because there's that tendency to lose muscle. Now, the other side of that is don't neglect your hormone balance. So you know, women even get a hit in testosterone. So, so do men that can compromise your muscles, the hit in progesterone that we get very early in perimenopause. A lot of doctors who don't know about perimenopause think that it starts in your late forties. It starts usually in your mid to late thirties. Those changes, the DHEA and the adrenals goes down, your testosterone starts to fall on your progesterone way before estrogen and the hot flashes hit you. So these issues with muscles and all that can start kind of in your late thirties. And paying attention to that hormone balance, making sure that you're getting hormones if you need them is pretty important. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so and, you know, it's different for everyone, like depending on your heritage. Some people, I've seen people with Mediterranean heritage that don't go through menopause until their late 50s. Some other, you know, ethnicities can go through really early, mid 40s. And if you have autoimmune issues, you can go through sooner. So it's really important to pay attention to you know, your family history with that and where you are. Makes sense. And and aging is so hard on its own. I mean, just the changes that you see in your body and your face and like just the aging process itself, it's not easy. How do we stay more positive? I know you have some tools like breathing tools and what can you do to keep yourself in a more positive state as you age? Well, I think a lot of what you talked about, I think the gratitude is super important. I think the the mind-body wellness practices is super important, things like prayer and meditation. I think uh, socialization and friends are really important. And pick friends that are positive, you know, uh, that are not energy vampires. Or if you have a friend who's an energy vampire, just realize who they are and be, be that, you know, light in their life, but don't let them take what you have. Um, so I think it's really important as we age to really socialize, to have hobbies, to have things that we look forward to. Uh, for me, that's belly dancing. I think that's kept me really young. It's something I did in college. I totally neglected it during the years that I was having babies, that I was 100 pounds overweight, that I was just working as an ICU physician. But it was one of the things that brought me back to feeling like a young person, you know, having that hobby that I loved, that I really wanted to do, that I wanted to dress up in these clothes that, you know, I wanted to look good in. Um, and so I think that's super important. Find some passion that is going to propel you forward, something you love to do, a hobby that you like. And it could be frivolous or it could be that you, you know, found something with a really deep meaning. I mean, you're helping the homeless and that's, that's you know, what's keeping you going. But I think passion is super important as we get older to give us something that, that propels us forward, having a plan. I think I saw, you know, an interview with a hundred and uh, two year old lady who had like a 10 year plan. <laughs> Um, and I think that's amazing. That's probably why she's 102 and still, you know, articulate. Um, so I think passions are super important. And it's something that we have to like keep at the forefront for ourselves. I love passion. Actually, my husband just turned 60. And right now, as we speak, he I got him driving, um, not driving, flying lessons for his uh, birthday. So he went flying just now. And that's something that he's really passionate about and he's always wanted to do. And he also doesn't like to exercise. So I signed him up for Pilates, which he actually took to on the reformer, because I just think look, we can always find something that we're passionate about. You know, it might not be the thing, the typical thing of going to the gym or, you know, or maybe dancing is not for us, but there is something that we'll be passionate about for us where we can also help us, you know, really feel good in our bodies and in our lives. Absolutely. Yes. 
So yeah, uh, and I think what you said is so important too. Is you know, look for the thing that is going to motivate you to exercise, and the thing that is going to give you passion. You know, don't don't give up on that because that's what's going to propel you forward as a healthy you know person who is aging but still keeping their vitality. I love that. How about vitamins? How important are the vitamins and the supplements we put in our body? Um, and how important is it to make sure that they really are quality vitamins? Absolutely. There's a lot of bad in the supplement industry. There's a lot of hokiness going on, a lot of things that are non-scientific. So go to a source you trust. Um, make sure that whatever manufacturer you're using has third-party testing. Uh, you know, in the United States, we have CGMP and NSF, which are uh, the two bodies that will do third-party testing. Uh, but Australia actually has the most stringent. The TGA out of Australia is uh, the most stringent. Uh, so things that are sold in Australia are usually fairly safe. If you're doing something in the U.S., make sure it's NSF and CGMP. So that, you know, what's on the label is on the label and nothing else, because there's a lot of supplements that have been found to have a lot of contaminants. You know, fish oils from one of the big box manufacturers, for instance, had PCBs, which are a horrible xenoestrogen chemical that can also be, you know, carcinogenic. So here I take the fish oil thinking you're helping yourself, but instead you're ingesting this bad chemical. And then their fish oils actually didn't even have much of the active ingredients in fish oil that really help you. So getting guidance from someone who really knows you and knows supplements and knows how to navigate that is pretty important, I think. Um, you know, I wish more physicians really know a lot about this field because there's so much you can do naturally. Um, I wish that we could get everything from food, but we live in a world where getting high quality food is not always possible. And so that's where supplementation can really be helpful. It can fill in those gaps. It can also be something that your body recognizes more naturally than medication that can sometimes help with things like normalizing blood sugar, uh, helping with normalizing blood pressure, helping with normalizing weight. Uh, things like magnesium and potassium can help with like muscle tone and energy. So all of these things can be helpful. Um, you know, of course, the first place you want to go is food. But sometimes if food is not adequate to get what you want, you want to get some quality supplements that are really, you know, have science behind them and are third party tested. So important to research everything. Thank you. How about um, as far as what, what are some antioxidant vitamins that you recommend that people may want to take as they age? So there's a few that I really love. Um, I actually have an anti-aging supplement coming out that I'm very excited about. It has everything that you need for the mitochondria. So the mitochondria are your little energy packets in your cell. They make kind of the currency of the dollars that, you're, that are used to run all the chemical reactions in your whole body. So the moment you stop making... ATP, which is this currency for running all the, you know, different reactions in your body is the minute your body will cease to actually work. So it's very, very important as we age, these little cell, these little energy packets get damaged through things like free radicals, chemicals, sometimes our genetics don't really support them very well. And so that's actually one of the hallmarks of aging is mitochondrial age. So um, the supplement that I really am so excited about putting together kind of, uh, takes all the things that are easy to take that really help the mitochondria. So coenzyme Q10 and alpha lipoic acid are two mitochondrial antioxidants that cross into these small energy packets, which are the most important thing. They're carried by something called acetyl-L-carnitine. So that's something that I coupled with these to carry them through. Phosphatidylserine forms the layer of these energy packets. The mitochondria also forms the layer of our adrenal cells. So it's really important in the function of our adrenals, which are these glands that help us deal with stress. So it has those in it. It has terostyl beans in it. And it has uh, NMN, which has been shown to really help with, you know, mitochondrial age, with hormone balance. So I'm putting this together, the supplement, which will be out in the next couple of months. It's going to be kind of what I call kind of the holy grail of anti-aging, which is mm -hmm. mitochondria. The other thing that I really like for most people, although some people have sensitivities to it and it can be kind of hard to take because it can be acidic if you don't take it with food, is a supplement curcumin, which comes from turmeric. It's the anti-inflammatory extract of turmeric. What you want to make sure with curcumin is that you're getting it from a company that actually has studies on the absorption of their curcumin. 
because curcumin is very hard to absorb from the gut. Most of the curcumins on the market will stay in your gut and they might help de-inflame your gut, but they're not really going to get into your body or cross into your blood-brain barrier, which is where they've been shown to really help. Uh, there's studies that it can show help with memory, that it can help uh, you know, decrease the inflammation in the brain. Of course, we know like Alzheimer's is an inflammatory disease in the brain. So uh, curcumin really helps with that. It helps with blood vessels. It helps with inflammation. So it helps with like keeping your joints limber. So if you don't have an issue with turmeric, then curcumin is really one of my very favorite supplements. Uh, and then probably fish oil would be a third for most people. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. And um, also, do you recommend... Oh, I apologize. Do you recommend uh, people juicing or fasting, like water fasting and juicing? Is that a good way to shed some weight? Uh, juicing, if you're doing vegetable juice, is great. Uh, I, if you're adding much fruit, you're probably going to get too much sugar. Um, so I like to do a pure green juice where I put like uh, celery and I'll put some kale and parsley and a little bit of lemon and ginger in it. Um, and that's really very much like a, you know, a great antioxidant that you can take kind of almost in lieu of vitamins. Um, so I do like green uh, vegetable juices, but if you start putting a lot of sugary things in it, then it's not so good because it can spike your blood sugar. I think a lot of people like to put apple and all that. Um, so juicing is good that way. Intermittent fasting is good for some people and not good for others. And it's very much a genetic answer again. <laughs> so there are people for whom their genetics actually make intermittent fasting quite advantageous. And there's people for whom the minute they intermittently fast, their body's like, oh, we're starving. We need to hang on to that. And those are the people that don't do well with intermittent fasting. And I've met a few of them. Now, I'd say 80% of us do actually pretty well with intermittent fasting. I advocate doing the fasting a little bit differently than most people. I like people to stack their eating in the beginning of the day when the mitochondria, those little energy packets in the cell are really active. So between like maybe 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. And then after four, if you really have to put something in your mouth, I advocate doing fast mimicking, like doing cucumbers and celery and things that have, you know, hardly any calories and, and you know, getting some fluid in. Um, of course, for those of us over 50, we don't want to drink too much fluid too late because so we don't want to get up over. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I really advocate people stacking their eating earlier in the day rather than late in the day because there's a lot of data that that's actually helpful. If you do get hungry at night, what are some foods that you recommend people can eat at night that are not going to really hurt their health or, you know, metabolize easily? Yeah, so high fiber foods, things like celery and cucumbers, like I mentioned, berries tend to be pretty low calorie and they can satisfy kind of a sweet tooth. Um, so they're my favorites. I'd like to get frozen berries and I love to let them sit in a bowl and have all their juices run and they just turn into this very delicious thing uh, that you can eat. So those are some of the foods that are pretty good at night and they're easy to digest. So they're not going to keep you up. A lot of times, you know, people actually have sleep problems because they eat too late and they're digesting so sleepy. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, so tell me a little bit about um, your programs coming up and how people can find you and learn more about what you do to help people age well. Thank you so much, Noah. So um, you can find me on Instagram. That's chiefly where I am, at doctor, D-O-C-T-O-R spelled out, dot E-M-I, at doctor, dot M-E. I am the same on TikTok, so Instagram and TikTok. And my link tree is actually where you can look at a lot of things that I'm doing. So there's a link at the bottom of your bio on both Instagram and TikTok and that link tree uh, links to a lot of the things I do. I have some free, um, you know, things people can look at for like their thyroid health and gut health that they can download and look at. Um, they can, you know, connect with a coach to talk about some of our programs there. Um, also dremy.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-E-M-I.com. That is my website, which has a lot of what I'm up to on there. Um, so those are great places to connect with me. I do answer my own DMs on Instagram. <laughs> so a lot of people are like, is this really you? And I'm like, yeah, it's me. Because <laughs> I, I like to actually get to know people. So um, so if you want to reach me, that's a great place. Um, you know, I can't, of course, offer medical advice to people who I'm not working with, but I can give you some general health tips, uh, answer general questions. Um, and I actually take a lot of the questions people send me in the DMs and turn them into videos. Um, so, you know, if you have something that's, that's on your mind, you know, I'd love to hear about it. I do work with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, 
mostly when it comes to body composition, losing fat, gaining muscle, aging backwards from the inside out. Um, and, you know, I do that as a capacity as a health coach. So um, I really help guide people to where they can go. And then a lot of times sort of help them establish a, a wellness routine with their regular physician or find a physician that's able to help them where they are. So that's something that I really love to do. Um, and it's, it's uh, something that I am passionate about. And then of course I have my supplement line, Vibrant Science. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that, that's also both on dremmy.com, my website and the link tree in my bio. So, and I have upcoming um, the Youthful Slim Challenge. Youthful Slim is a supplement that I invented that helps with leptin and insulin resistance, which are the chief reasons most of us over 35 have issues losing weight. Now I had bigger issues than that, that I had to correct, but those were my main issues. And so a lot of people, especially women over 35 have that. So we have a challenge going on. You can join a Facebook group through um, Instagram or TikTok through our link tree. You can um, purchase the supplements, which really help with this at a discounted price. Um, and we're going to give you tips on what to do. So a lot of the things Noah and I were talking about, about water drinking, reminding you to do your mind, body, wellness, eating fiber before meals, um, you know, having the presence of mind to, you know, eat only what you need. All of that is going to be part of what we do in the challenge. So I really, you know, if you want to kind of a leg up, uh, you know, before you are able to do even the testing or get some of the personal answers, you can start with some really healthy habits right there. I love that, Dr. Amy. So when does the challenge start? So the challenge starts the first week of October. So it's coming right up. So go to at drspellbat.emi at either Instagram or TikTok. Click that link tree. Join the Facebook group. Watch for our videos because we're going to be talking about it a lot. So, yeah. So I'm really excited to get that started because a lot of people, I think, wait for that New Year's resolution to get started with their health. And I'm trying to get people ready for the holiday season. So they're actually in a healthy mood and a healthy mindset going into the holidays. I think they can have a much better holiday season when they actually are grounded and ready to make healthier choices. What's the name of the supplement one more time? Vibrant Slim? Youthful Slim. Oh, Youthful Slim. I apologize. Youthful Slim. So you want to hear something funny? I was going through your Instagram yesterday and I literally, uh -huh. you said that it helped you lose weight and I literally took a snapshot of it and I'm like, I got to get the supplement. So that's so funny that's that you, you said that. So I'm definitely interested in being part of this challenge. It sounds amazing. Awesome. Yeah, we would love to have you more. Thank you so much, Dr. Amy. It's truly been so mind opening to have you here. And I learned so much about how to be able to start taking better care of myself. Uh, please make sure you follow Dr. Amy on Instagram, on her website, see everything that she's up to. She's truly an inspiration. I want to thank you all for joining us today on this podcast. Um, till next time, remember to have a grateful heart to ground in love and compassion, and always know that you are guided by God. I can't wait to see you again next time. Please keep present to the miracles in your life every day. Have a beautiful rest of your day, everyone. Namaste.